When I started this channel, there were plenty of games I wanted to cover, many of which are well known. But there are also the games that fell through the cracks, which barely anybody talks about anymore. It's always exciting to talk about games like that, since I'm not just revealing my thoughts on a popular subject, but exposing it to a new audience. Today, I want to talk about one of those games, a little Nintendo 64 platformer gem called Rocket Robot on Wheels. On the one hand, I can see why this one doesn't get that much attention. It's easy to look at it and think it's just one of many mascot platformers that were dime a dozen in the 90s and early 2000s. But even if you've never heard of it, you've probably heard of the developer, Sucker Punch Productions. They're responsible for series like Sly Cooper and Infamous, and the phenomenal Ghost of Tsushima. Rocket, however, was their first ever project, and although Sucker Punch is now firmly a Sony studio, this game was developed for the N64 since they felt that they couldn't compete with the PlayStation library at the time. They reached out to numerous publishers, including Sony, before Ubisoft finally agreed to publish the game after seeing it at E3 1999. Most people who played this as a kid are probably nostalgic for it, myself included. I don't think we ever owned this one, it was likely we'd rent it from Blockbuster, but I remember playing it a lot growing up. However, until now, I've never fully beaten it, so it's time to finally dust off this old model and give it the attention it deserves. If you've never played Rocket Robot on Wheels, your first question is probably about what you do in the game. Well, as the titular Robot on Wheels Rocket, or technically he's just on one wheel, but whatever, you're exploring several worlds, doing some platforming, interacting with puzzles in the environment, and collecting stuff that unlocks more stuff. So yes, at its core, it's the same 3D collect-a-thon platformer that was everywhere back in 1999, and even back then, you had to try pretty hard to stand out. So how does Rocket stand out? Well, as Rocket, you have to travel to different levels, complete objectives to grab Whoopi World tickets that open up more levels, and Tinker tokens that let you buy more moves and thus beat more challenges to collect more tickets, and so on and so forth. Very stock stuff, and it might be easy to write this off as just another mascot platformer following in the wake of Mario 64 and Banjo-Kazooie. So many games released back then followed this formula, and if you grew up in this era, you probably have your own favorite hidden gems. Looking back on this era, though, platforming did tend to fall by the wayside. Like, I love Banjo, but it paid less attention to the platforming mechanics in favor of pure collection, and not everybody is a fan of that. On the other hand, Rocket strikes a solid balance between collecting and platforming, thanks primarily to its physics. I noticed this as a kid, but couldn't exactly put it into words, but the physics engine in Rocket is surprisingly robust. Rocket's jumps and movements feel like they have a natural weight, more so than most platformers I've played. A detail I love, for example, is that you can see Rocket absorb the shock of a considerable fall, demonstrating the impact of each jump. This is hard to explain just by talking about it, you have to play the game to see what I mean, but there is a solid curve in how gravity and Rocket's moves affect his behavior. On the subject of moves, there aren't a ton in Rocket, but they all tie into that physics forward design. Your basic moveset is just moving, jumping, and grabbing items with Rocket's tractor beam. That latter part basically serves as your primary tool for dealing with enemies, either throwing things at them or, you know, throwing them. Or you'll grab an object to push it somewhere else, or grab a part of the scenery and swing on it. The swinging does feel a bit more finicky than I remember, and considering how much you need to do this to get around, especially in levels like Food Fright, it did start to bother me by the end. Making a physics engine is difficult though, especially for a first time developer, and even if it doesn't hold up perfectly, I still appreciate the ingenuity. And although the technology created to make Rocket possible is impressive, what's even more amazing is that Sucker Punch took a straightforward approach to creating gameplay challenges. Everything you do in this game is centered around physics in some way, and they get the most out of it before the end. Look at Rocket's upgradable moves, for example. There's nothing super extravagant here for the most part. The slam for killing enemies, the double jump for double the jumps, and the grapple to extend the range of your tractor beam. All pretty simple. The freeze ray is the most unique ability, which lets you build ice platforms to get across water, but even that extends the core gameplay instead of introducing something new. Platforming is the star of the show, and that's true of the challenges as well. Again, to compare to the Banjo series, many of that series' objectives are more about performing context-sensitive actions at the appropriate place. Even when Rocket gets fancier with the goals, it doesn't ever go in that direction. 
I'd argue the closest it gets are the vehicles, some of which are more task-focused and don't provide mobility upgrades. The best are probably the Dune Dog, which is super fast, the Finbot for better swimming, and the Shag Flyer for getting around tall buildings. Although even then, the first two aren't utilized the best. The former is in a level that isn't built for fast speeds, and the latter is mainly relegated to a linear section. Others, like the Hover Splat and Beam Lift, are really only useful for specific scenarios, and don't help much in getting around. The Beam Lift is relegated to a single damn room, so it's basically just a puzzle solver and nothing else. Also, a special anti-shoutout to the Glider Bike, an ultra-fast vehicle that's difficult to control well on land and impossible to control in the air. Well, even when I'm not having as much fun with the gameplay, I can still appreciate the graphics that hold up well for a mid-cycle N64 game. It's pretty basic, with colored polygons for the characters and simple textures on the environments. The artist got a lot out of the N64, rendering just enough detail in the terrain and structures to make the levels look unique without going overboard. It's a very cartoony game, and it definitely looks and sounds like one, with cartoony sound effects all over the place and relatively few vocal grunts from our robotic protagonist. Though I do love the little yeah Rocket gives when he grabs onto a pole. It's pretty cute. Anyway, on the audio front, I also seriously love the soundtrack. As simple as it is, it's got so many fantastic grooves. The sound font features instruments like horns, vibraphones, organs, and pianos, hitting that carefree carnival vibe. And the melodies are so good, this might be my nostalgia talking, but this music is incredibly underappreciated. I couldn't verify who composed this soundtrack, though I believe it's the late Ashif Hakik, who wrote for the first Sly Cooper game as well as Tomba 2 and Crash Nitro Kart. It fits his music style pretty well, so it's a likely possibility. Given that the game's setting is an amusement park, you'd imagine that it'd be integrated into the level's concepts, but I think the designers prioritized this on some levels over others. Whoopi World features this to a T on the visual front. It matches the childlike sense of wonder you get from theme parks, as well as the kitschy nature and cheesy design. However, it's not constructed like a park, it's built like a video game hub world, which makes sense. But let's look at the actual worlds, and I'll say right now, if you hate puns, then sorry, strap yourself in. We start with Clowny Island, a solid opening stage that's very compact. This is by far the most theme park-esque level. The name referencing Coney Island is the first tip, but this one has rides, attractions, and even a midway. This is also where many of my memories were when playing this game as a kid, with building your own roller coaster being the highlight. I played a lot of Roller Coaster Tycoon 2 growing up, and this hit the same note for me back then, and still kinda does. Then we move on to Paint Misbehavin', which goes in the opposite direction with Ancient Roman theming. Not an Ancient Roman themed park, mind you, but just a Roman world, albeit one combined with the concept of painting. It's a pretty cool idea, although the paint concept doesn't extend beyond the early puzzles. It does have some solid water sections though, especially a really fun one towards the end. The third level, mind-blowing, is where the physics-based design really comes into focus, with a level built into a mineshaft. And this is literally just a mineshaft. I have no idea why visitors to Whoopi World would find this interesting, but what do I know? I guess there is a minecart ride, which I enjoy very much, but there are also gems that react explosively to each other, which I can't imagine is a good attraction. The camera is annoying here thanks to all the tight corridors, but the platforming is pretty enjoyable. Now we come to Arabian Flights, full of high-rise buildings above the clouds. You get around these via flying carpet, and thus it's less about platforming and more so figuring out where the hell all the challenges are. The intriguing thing about Rocket is that the level themes are all pretty great, yet they sometimes get in the way of the actual game. So much of this level is open space, and flying around isn't the most exciting thing to do. The fifth world is Pyramid Scheme, and that name is the best part of this world. You have two mirrored themes in one here, a jungle-themed one and a lava-themed one, both built around the same central pyramid. Both are as large as the levels that came before them, but they have the same amount of collectibles split between both halves. They look so visually distinct that I wish they were two different levels, mainly because the objectives where you switch between them don't integrate the mechanics super well. That's bad enough, but the objectives here are incredibly annoying, with some of the strictest timers and most precarious platforming in the game. I went for 100% completion for this video, but I don't think I would again just because of this level. It's that frustrating. 
It doesn't get much better with the final main level, Food Fright, which has an admittedly interesting theme, blending a horror world with one based around food. That's really cool, but this stage is built vertically, with three sections stacked on top of each other like a tower. I've talked about how I don't like levels like this, and Rocket has no warp system, so if you die at the top, you have to make the long trek back up there. Even considering the areas on their own, they aren't the best. The middle section is a solid enough platforming gauntlet, but there just isn't enough going on in the other two areas that engages me, especially with this spider rider contraption that kinda sucks for piloting on water. Once you've got enough tickets, you can enter the final level, JoJo's World, and yes, that's the villain of this bizarre adventure. I should probably explain the plot briefly so you're up to speed. Rocket is an invention of Dr. Gavin, a proprietor of Whoopi World and the owner of its two mascots, the titular walrus Whoopi and the raccoon sidekick Jojo. I know what you're thinking when you see a raccoon in a sucker punch game, but unlike Sly Cooper, this guy is a jerk. He's taken over the park because of second banana jealousy, and Rocket ain't gonna have that. Back to JoJo's World, a long and linear set of platforming challenges, incorporating everything you've learned in the game up to this point, and even recycling some old objectives. It's essentially an endurance test, and it's annoying having to restart all the way back at the beginning if you die, but it's not that much of a struggle. Anyway, you defeat JoJo, collect your final ticket, and then Dr. Gavin unceremoniously shows up again to rename the park Rocket World in honor of your achievements. Yippee! And that's Rocket Robot on Wheels, a game I personally adore and one that I think needs to get on more people's radars. It's not just incredibly nostalgic for me, but it's also a well-designed and unique game that sticks out in a field that was already well overrun by the time it came out. Sometimes it's easy for games like this to be lost to time as mainstream titles get all the focus, but Rocket doesn't deserve to be forgotten. There isn't exactly an easy way to play Rocket today besides getting an N64 copy, and unfortunately, prices for those have skyrocketed. I think I managed to snag one for maybe 10 or 15 bucks a couple of years ago, but as of making this video, they're not going for less than 80 bucks on eBay, which is a goddamn shame. If you can get one cheap, I highly recommend it, and if you can't, well, there are other ways. Still, the game itself is a blast, and a testament to the quality of Sucker Punch Productions. They nailed it right out of the gate, and as we've seen, they've grown to be quite a major force in their own regard, and it all started with one little robot. Want to support this channel? Why not leave a like and a comment down below? It helps out a lot. And make sure to subscribe if you want to see more.